Your Honor, Mr. Osborne would like to address the court briefly. I would just like to say that I wish this would never happen. I don't, I don't exactly know why I did this, but I just ask that you give me hope for a future and get me help because I do need help. I just want help. I'll do whatever you say. Mr. F, Mr. Campbell, have you explained to Mr. Osborne that I've never set aside a judge so we've got 10 days to appeal? I have, Your Honor. Let me say from the outset, in the morning, this case clearly has been a nightmare for everyone. Clearly from the victims and their families, for your family, for the fact that I never thought that I would be sitting here in a courtroom looking at a 17-year-old boy and having him sent to a minimum of 30 years after life in jail because of the things he did when he was 14 years old. It's just beyond my imagination. But does everybody agree that under the current state of the law, the children are considered constitutionally different? One, that only in the rarest of occasions should a sentence of life without a possibility of parole be issued for a juvenile. In those cases, the juvenile should essentially be found irreparably corrupt. However, the current state of the law is that I can sentence him to life without a possibility of parole. Anybody disagree with those propositions? No, sir. And for the purposes of what we've been doing this week, and I said at the outset of this case, and I'll repeat on the record the factors that I consider with that structure that I just went over, were spelled out in Aiken v. Byers. Those factors would include the following, the chronological age of Mr. Osborne and the hallmark features of youth, which would include immaturity, impetuosity, failure to appreciate the risks and consequences of his acts, irresponsibility and recklessness. Also, Mr. Osborne's family and home environment, circumstances surrounding the offense, and considering the extent of participation by Mr. Osborne, and how any familial or peer pressures may have affected him, the incompleteness associated with youth, the example of the case of Kevin, the inability to deal with police officers, prosecutors, or health attorneys, or assistance attorneys, and lastly, the possibility of rehabilitation, given the child's diminished culpability and heightened capacity for change, and the broken occasions for sentencing. Juveniles with the harshest penalty would be very uncommon. That being said, let me go over the factors as I've seen them. I've read in excess of 2,000 pages prior to being from the court of Davis, and a lot of testimony. I've read more during this week. It is clear that Mr. Osborne is immature. He's as passionate as he was when he was 14. I wouldn't mind what he's done as fully, and I think he is now. As of September 28, 2016, he was a normal 14-year-old boy, but in other respects, he methodically researched and planned out this attack, as well as other aspects of the case. I don't believe for a second that Mr. Osborne failed to appreciate the risk of his consequences and his conduct. I think he did. On the other hand, he may not have known what it felt like to actually kill somebody, but I think he understood that his actions could lead to his being killed or to him having to spend life in prison or a lengthy prison sentence. Also, responsibility. There are elements that show that Mr. Osborne was responsible. That is, that he got up and worked in the family business. He had chores around the house. There's also elements of irresponsibility. He stopped doing schoolwork, stayed up to all hours of the day on the Internet, and stayed on social media, roughly unchecked by either his father or his mother. Clearly, and I agree with Dr. Mack so hard, 
the family and home environment was problematic and they clearly had an impact on this gentleman. I don't see how possibly they couldn't have had an impact on this gentleman. Well, that being said, his father uh, was found to be verbally and physically abusive to both Mr. Osborne and other members of his family. Uh, he was a substance abuser. Likewise, Ms. Osborne, from the records that I read, appears to be somewhat of a substance abuser to some degree, uh, certainly not to the extent that Mr. Osborne was, uh, but appeared to me, and my impression of it is that she was somewhat absent in this case. And meaning, by meaning of that is, Mr. Osborne was allowed essentially to exile himself in his basement. Uh, he stayed up all hours of the day. He had unfettered un, um, ac unchecked access and unfettered access to the internet and social media, which allowed him to become uh, coupled with this rainbow group that was out there. Uh, he wasn't even required to do the school crop uh, assignments by reports, and they were allegedly done by his mother. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the maternal grandparents, uh, paternal grandparents, seemed to be a bright spot for him. They seemed to give him some guidance and stability. Uh, but the concern that I have in this case is that I've known Dr. Maddox for a long time. I hired her as a court witness, as a court witness. Uh, I don't know. Uh, Dr. Flagler or the manager. I have no reason to disregard them. They seem to be extremely well qualified. But either choice leads me to some problems. First, if I were to follow Dr. Ballinger Wagner, this gentleman's not going to get better. He doesn't have a treatable, he can't be treated. He's always going to be there. And I tend not to do that. I, I, I agree that Dr. Max is probably right in that he. <clears throat> has suppressed emotional problems. And I, this is a junior psychiatrist over here, a psychologist making observations. I don't know. But even so, by Dr. Madison's own testimony, what SEDC can provide is insufficient. And he is going to require to get private work while he is incarcerated in the SEDC for him to have any hope and that's where my concern lies. The testimony that I believe to be accurate is that this family has irreparable differences between Mr. Arthur's mother and the grandfather and grandmother. They're currently fighting and they have been in the family system broken down. While Mr. Uh, the grandfather said, I will uh, provide this needed extra private uh, psychiatric help, I'm not convinced that's going to happen. As he said himself, he's old. I think he characterized himself as being dead man walking, which I don't agree with, but the problem is, assuming he did, once he's gone, once him and his wife are gone, we're all getting older, I don't believe he'd get any help. So that leads us back to square one. Although Mr. Osborne had a tough upbringing, it clearly impacted on him. Um, there are other people out there who have tough upbringings. They have alcohol parents, they have abusive parents, they have a combination. But um, this was a heinous murder, a murderers. Uh, if it stopped with your dad, we may have a different situation. I don't know. I'm not saying that dad's a bad person, but when he drank, obviously, he had propensity for violence and abuse. Um, but, you know, whatever peer pressure may have led to your decision to go out and shoot up the school, do the things you did, you did it. And you planned it. Quite frankly, reading the social media post, I can't tell whether you were leading that group or they were leading you. You were certainly the first one out of the, uh, the shoes to go do this. Um, you certainly were the ones, uh, although cut the pace as Mr. Epps pointed out, the information about pipe bombs. Uh, sad, and who knows what difference it would make. 
uh, while you need to have counsel, you and granddad are out there throwing these uh, pipe bombs or drain bombs out there shooting all my guns. I hunt, I fish, I stand guns. I don't see anything wrong with you shooting guns. I see the, 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 the impropriety here, or what's wrong here, is that your parents, your mother and your dad, there's no other ones, let you down and that they didn't get you any help. It may have made a difference, may not, because quite frankly, that was just a few short months before you engaged in the horrific acts involved in this case. So we're all familiar with the act with the accidents of the facts around his murders. Uh, as to his fourth factor, the completeness associated with you, there's certainly no evidence that he hadn't been able to help his attorneys in this matter, to assist his attorneys. Um, and while it might have been that what well, may not have been the best the decisions, the way the Miranda and speak to law enforcement at the time he did, quite frankly, I don't think necessarily it made much of a difference. The overwhelming evidence in this case was that he was guilty. But when he decided to talk to law enforcement, he did so very particularly. He was able to uh, engage with his uh, questioners and, and, and people who were speaking with him. And I saw no signs of any incompetencies in that regard. Uh, with that being said, I want to point out to law enforcement that concerns me to a great deal. The fact that this gentleman had a lawyer requested for him and y'all refused. I know you have a right to, and that comes before me. One of the factors under Jackson Dino is isolating a child from his parents. That is a real concern. Um, <clears throat> in this case, Mr. Uh, Osborne was sophisticated enough to engage in uh, symptom magnification and fabrication. Uh, he looked up different helmets, tried to uh, act as if he had those. And he knew from the start that that's what he was going to have to do. I feel comfortable. Uh, he, knew that, he manipulated the facts in this case. Quite frankly, when he was, he was, he was outside evidence where he was bullied and he reported that bullying at Western, it's clear. However, that expanded to bullying going on back in uh, Cadillac Elementary. And I've seen other than his statements in that regard. I've seen nothing about that. I heard something about it from his grandfather today. But uh, if you look at his school records, that doesn't seem to be indicative of any such thing or wrong. The reason I say that is that uh, Mr. Osmond has been smart enough and clever enough to manipulate the facts if it suits him and provides him a defense in this case. I certainly agree with the finding that he's more sophisticated socially than most, although he has a average intelligence and you might be somewhat of a social outcast because of the fact that you uh, were by yourself in a situation of honor. Um, I tell you quite frankly one of the things that stands out the most to me is that you like remorse. That is a great concern. Dr. Maddox says that she feels like it is likely the result of him suppressing his emotions and he deals with those and at some point he will. Again, you know, that's going to require outside of private counseling, inside the Department of Corrections, that nobody can count on. Um, I, I quite frankly don't think that under those circumstances, Mr. Hopkins will be able to. Not because he can't be, but I don't think he will be. On the other hand, if Dr. Ballinger's I don't know why he can't be. So the sentence is going to be life in prison for the murders. It's going to be 30 years on the attempted murders. We have 10 days to the people. Good luck. Thank you. Your Honor, can I speak with my client? Absolutely.